first, thank you, always, to the, to the Air Culture for the invitation and the opportunity and for the amazing conversations that happen throughout. Birth is smelly, bloody, dirty, messy, bestial. Whether it is vaginal or surgical, there is no easy way out. <laughs> <laughs> the epidural can ease the pain, but not the existential fear. You will be turned inside out, if not during the birth, then during the pregnancy, if not the pregnancy, by the nursing, by the sleepless night, the mind-bending loneliness. Sooner or later, you will break down. You will think, believe, you cannot go on. You will realize that if you ever thought that facing yourself, the bloody, ugly, sublime truth of yourself was the ultimate responsibility, you were wrong. It is to face yourself and realize you cannot run away because another life, your child's, depends on this ultimate self-encounter. Welcome to mamahood. That's from Maya Williams' introduction in Revolutionary Mothering, which was just released this year. These are bloody, dirty, messy, bestial times, and I am feeling bloodied and dirtied and messed up that is fucked over and fucked up and in my rage, bestial. These times are turned inside out, and I am turned inside out with them. I feel this bone-crushing responsibility and responsibility. Welcome to mamahood. This is not the paper I was originally going to present. That's a familiar refrain. <laughs> that paper was about fun, quite literally about the band Fun and their <coughs> song We Are Young, featuring Janelle Monet. It wasn't actually about fun, the band, but it was fun, and it was about Janelle Monet and about Beyonce feminism, and about how after modernism's crisis and crash, poptimism might echo a cultural shift, a cultural climate change even, in the relationship between pop culture and politics, particularly the politics of the intellectually belabored and sorely maligned left. T.J. Clark, in his nihilistic feature in the New Left Review, urged the left not to go on ex exalting its marginality, but rather to look its insignificance in the face. I think we've seen it. Mm -hmm. And what better way than through a catchy tune about the inherently nihilistic state of being young? I meant to crash through Clark's sing-song metaphor of politics tragic key and into the crisis of epic climate catastrophe that we are all, young or not, rehearsing toward the end of the world. Well, actually, we are at the end of the world now. Not the end of the world, the Earth itself, yet, but the end of the world as we know it. Maybe I should have used REM instead, though I do not feel fine. <laughs> On November 8th, an orange talking STD, thank you, Rachel Bloom, took away all the fun. And now I need a new song, I need a new metaphor. So I thought I would write about the Thulacy, that determinately present and in the present fugitive space, like Deleuze and Guattari's fugitive little girl who operates in a different time, and maybe that different time is the present itself, the one that we keep avoiding somehow. And still having a little fun, I thought I would consider the sonic in the phonic. But as I tried to put together a playlist of how the thulacine sounds itself, I kept censoring my own ability to use these sonic phonic expressions of different fugitive bodies, because I would inevitably be collapsing the context of their sounding, and in their sounding, their worlding, I would be conflating and colluding and collapsing these worldings in sad favor of wording, and I just wasn't up to it. <laughs> <laughs> and so a different paper, a very difficult paper, about a little boy and a young man, and the other silence in the photographs of them, Photographs that speak volumes not to truth, but to feeling. Welcome to Mamahood. The figure is removed from any context on the otherwise blank ground, and of any color other than the stark red of the thread, simultaneously an outline of simply a toddler in child pose, maybe sleeping, and a tracing and trace of a photograph of a boy who drowned. The outline of this child both interrupts and disrupts the mainstream and alternative Western and global press's narrative story of narrative of this story. And this image of this boy now exists in both contexts, the political narrative and the aesthetic. The blankness on or in which the boy lays speaks as much to the unstated and unstitched reality it implies as to the explicit materiality of the unprimed canvas. Aylan Kurdi was three years old when he and his mother, Rian, father Abdullah, and five-year-old brother, Galib, attempted to cross the Mediterranean Sea from the northern Syrian town of Kobani to the Greek island of Kos, en route to Abdullah's sister, Tima Kurdi, in Vancouver, Canada. The photograph that Nilofer Demir took of him on September 2nd, 2015, which I will not show here, 
on a beach near the Turkish resort town Bodrum, has traveled still farther. A profound and difficult image that stands in for the Syrian refugee crisis, and that for some time, at least, made that crisis all the more real to a broader international audience, as if it wasn't, even though it was, real enough before. In Demir's photograph, Kurdi's body, prone, lies on the wet pebbled sand, half in and half out of the tide, wearing a red t-shirt hitched up a bit to his chest, navy shorts, and small white-soled navy sneakers. He is in the center foreground of the photograph. The sea fills the majority of the frame, and in the background there is what seems to be the limit of a rocky incline. Just a foot or two behind Kurdi stands a Turkish police officer, in uniform, in a dark green cap, a red and navy jacket, and greenish tan khaki pants, tucked into his combat boots. His back is to the camera, and he seems to be holding something in his hands blocked from view. Eleven people, including Island Kurdi's mother and brother, of the 23 other people crossing the sea in two boats, died when the boats capsized. At the time of the photograph, more than 2,600 people were known to have died in 2015 in such crossings. In 2016, as of October 26, this number has exceeded 3,800. According to CNN reporter Richard Ellen Green, one person out of every 88 has been lost at sea trying to reach the shores of Greece, Italy, or Spain. On September 4th, UK-based performance artist Franco B. posted an image on his Facebook page of a stitched canvas he created in memory of Ivan Curdy. It is, like this year's photograph, profound and difficult, a testament to Ivan Curdy's life, as well as his death, and a betrayal in its representation of, to recall Peggy Phelan, the original photograph's original failure to see. It is an image whose work, at least in part, is to bear the burden of feeling in its aesthetic mediation. The unsettled dramaturgy with which mainstream media handles events forces the event into aesthetic context, but, as Josette Ferrell suggests, the application of theatricality to the representation of the event allows the spectator to comprehend the vastness of its tragedy. Amelia Jones wrote on a comment to Facebook B, I haven't seen the original photo and will not. Now I certainly don't need to. This says it all. I understand Jones' sentiment, though I'm skeptical of the image's ability or of any image's ability to say it all. I also wonder how it is that she avoided the photograph that so permeated mainstream and social media. Franco B's image does not quite say it all. It, like any artwork or performance in its relation to the real, does not and cannot tell the full story of Island Kurdi, nor of the Syrian refugee crisis. Nilofer Demir's photograph also does not tell the full story, though its distribution through international press changed the way that the story and other stories were being told. As part of the Visual Social Media Labs project, the iconic image on social media, Francesco Di Arazzo reports that, following the mainstream publication of the photograph of Island Kurdi, there was a semantic shift from migrant to refugee in reference to Syrian refugees in social media. Before mainstream press printed the photograph, the terms migrants and refugees appeared in North American press and social media 5.2 million versus 5.3 million times, respectively. After the photograph, public opinion radically flipped toward refugees, with the term refugees appearing 6.5 million times and migrants only 2.9 million. However, as the European Journalism Observatory reports, though Western European newspapers became significantly more sympathetic towards migrants and refugees in the week following the publication of Jasir's photograph, soon not only had most reverted to their original editorial position, but by the end of the month, all were less positive than at the beginning. How mainstream press contextualizes such photographs significantly influences public opinion about the issues animated in or by the photographs. This we know. We may very well know it because we learned it on Facebook, the site from which, as Joshua Benton, director of Harvard University's Neiman Journalism Lab tells, 40% of the traffic to news sites come. Such affective response became evident again in the shift in North American mainstream press reporting on the bombings in southern Beirut after the Paris terrorist attacks or rather, in the way mainstream and social media responded to the Paris attacks and then retroactively shifted their response to Beirut, to attacks in Baghdad and in Kenya. In a post for Al Jazeera, Beirut reporter, editor, and journalist Habib Bata took Western news outlets to task for their coverage of Hezbollah attacks on Bor al Barana, oh, pardon me, on November 12, 2015, in comparison to their handling of the terrorist attacks in Paris the following day. Whereas headlines about Beirut focused on the attackers and on the target as a Hezbollah stronghold or bastion, headlines about Paris featured graphic and intimate details about the victims. 
When the coverage rationalizes a tragedy as part of the military conflict, Batal writes, it both dehumanizes the victims and serves the interests of the attackers by increasing, increasing one-dimensional stereotypes and thus othering those who suffer in faraway places. <clears throat> he continues, not only do these narratives feed into rightist, xenophobic, or Islamophobic political views, they also color the perceptions of readers and editors at mainstream publications. Social media indignation elicit, elicited media-rated concern, and the New York Times, as Vada points out, changed its headlines at least two times over the Beirut attacks, shifting from the initial headline, deadly blast hits Hezbollah stronghold, to deadly blast hits Hezbollah area, and finally, to deadly blast hits crowded neighborhood. As Facebook profile pictures took on the blue, white, and red hue filter of the French flag, or the adapted iconography of the peace sign with the Eiffel Tower at its center, memes began to appear reminding fellow users of the attacks in Beirut and then Baghdad, then Kenya. Yet, to paraphrase a post by Tavia Nyong'o on his now defunct Facebook wall, that media concern for these other and other locations emerged retroactive to expressions of sympathy and solidarity with Paris, only reinforces a neoliberal strata of care whereby any sort of affective response to events outside the West's immediate purview must first be activated through a Western referent. I would like to try to invert this inequity of care by looking with the photograph of Island Kurdi via Franco B's canvas toward another photograph of another prone body and another photograph that I will not show here today, that of 28-year-old Omar Rahman. Rahman is not in the unnamed photographer's intention the subject of the image, but he becomes so <coughs> posthumously through his mother's advocacy of his denied rights as subject, of his subjectification even after death to police brutality and belittling of his human condition. The position of mother, and what I will argue is an <coughs> affective and politically efficacious act of feeling mothering, theoretically or figuratively, in the case of Desir's photograph of Island Kurdi, and adamantly or literally in that of Omar Rahman, creates a thread between these two photographs and between these two boys. And I say boys because Omar Rahman remains his mother's son. It is a connection contingent upon the interconnectivity of non-normative kinship structures emergent from feminist and queer subversions of biologically and societally constructed familial structures, and as well a connection in its particular reference to the very gendered imperatives placed upon the notion of mother that might also utilize the stereotypical tropes and expectations of mothering to signify a performance of decolonization within a digital virtual space that deflects formalized understandings of kinship away from dyadic, heteronormative structures, and instead gestures toward land and bodies, binding together present and future acts of resistance and of care. On November 3rd, 2016, St. Louis, Missouri's KMOV News 4 released a photograph that revealed an unnamed white officer from the North County Police Cooperative with Omar Rahman's African-American body. The unidentified police officer in full uniform with billy club and another weapon, whether a gun or a taser is unclear to me, slung over his right hip, white well-shined black shoes and blue latex gloves, is holding in his left hand Rahman's limp right wrist. Rahman, whose image other than his right arm, like the top half of the officer's face, is deliberately blurred, is lying on the floor next to a brown couch. The officer has a slightly toothy smile or smirk on his face and with his right hand is giving the photographer a thumbs up. The photograph is dated August 8th, the day of Rahman's alleged drug overdose. Rahman is marked in the iteration of other black and brown bodies whose deaths remain connected to police brutality, brutality and yet unmarked as well, as it does not appear that the officer in the photograph was directly or indirectly responsible for his death. According to NCCP chief Tim Swope, who has refused KMOV's invitation to comment on the photo and their offer to view the photo before publication, investigations into the photograph remain incomplete. Before releasing the photograph, KMOV shared it with Rahman's mother, Kim Staten, who has since sought legal representation over the officer's treatment of her son's body. Following the release, which the NCCP claims was stolen from evidence files, and which KMOV asserts was set to, sent to their investigative reporter, Lauren Traeger, from an anonymous source in law enforcement, the NCCP posted a letter on the department's official Facebook page, citing Chief Swope in defense of the officer. As the letter reads, this photograph depicts an officer positioning a deceased, deceased person in order to allow a detective to take a picture of the scene. It continues, the officer gave the thumbs up sign related to his positioning of the body in response to the photographer's question as to whether he was ready for the photo to be taken. This might be a rational of Kella's explanation for the thumbs up. 
as it might be the detective's argument that he did not realize the officer was in the frame of the photograph when the detec detective was taking it. However, as Traeger emphasizes in her story about this photograph, the letter does not address the expression on the officer's face. These two photographs and the experience of the toddler and young man depicted in them are distinct in geography, culture, and context, and yet they are not disconnected from each other. Two soft bodies rendered prone, subjected to violences and deaths not of their own control. Both Eileen Kurdi and Omar Rahman are rendered prone and rendered image, reproduced and distributed, signified by and signifying their own precarity and standing in for and symbolizing the precarity of marked bodies on other, either side of ideological and actual worlds. To connect these two images and people, Island Kurdi and Omar Rahman, Syrian refugee crisis and imperiled state of brown and black bodies in North America, brought together for me initially in my encounter with them through social media, is to embrace subversive and pluralistic understandings of kinship. Judith Butler's definition of kinship practices as inclusive of fundamental forms of human dependency, which may include birth, child rearing, relations of emotional dependency and support, generational ties, illness, dying, and death, to name a few. And Donna Haraway's figuration of odd kin, or Patricia Hill Collins' other mothering, wherein one takes on the responsibility for others within and beyond one's community, and wherein that community is not defined through immediately identifiable proximities. I'd like to push these connections further to recent work in mothering studies that thinks through how new technologies inform and extend maternal identity, maternal embodiment, and maternal agency, while also complicating the biological imperative, at least metaphorically at work in much of that scholarship, and in my own motivation to engage in it, even as the field challenges definitions of mothering predicated on biology. That is, to bring kinship back to the particular figure of the mother through the affective work of feeling mothering, without limiting such figuring to sex, gender, biology, or as mothering studies rethinks intimacy through the digital virtual to physical proximity. Mothering, as Shelley Park writes, like gender itself, is a technology, a social artifice produced by shifting power relations, not an essential identity tied to natural bodies. But I would also like to allow a space for natural bodies within this work of this refiguring and also within the work of feeling mothering. To do this, I'd like to conclude by reading closely and slowly with Shelley Park's idea of technologies of co-presence in her chapter, Cyber Mothering, included in Mothers Who Deliver, speaking of unsettled metaphors, <laughs> feminist interventions in public and interpersonal discourse. Park defines technologies of co-presence, those are social media and communication technologies, as technologies that allow us to be present <coughs> to and with others in ways not tied to the physical facticity of the body. Such technologies restructure, to a greater or lesser degree, our experiences of ourselves as agents in space and time. That is, they restructure our understanding of human subjectivity, and in doing so, as Park writes, they make possible extensions and transformations of ourselves that engage in the critical self-reflection necessary to loving one another, consciously and intentionally, across emotional and cognitive as well as geographic and temporal boundaries. To think through these two photographs, and particularly to think Nilifer de Sears' photograph of Eileen Curdy through Franco B's stitched canvas, and to think the photograph of Omar Rahman through his mother's advocacy for him, is to think through feeling mothering at two distinct but concurrent levels, that of the figurative and that of the literal. And here I borrow from artist-scholar Eliza Schwartz's definition of figuration as the ways in which a body becomes sensible to a viewer through visual and linguistic representation. What I mean by this is that in the doubled figuration of Eileen Kurdi through photograph turned canvas, the way in which he, and by extension the Syrian refugee crisis, becomes sensible is predicated upon an animation and implication of the viewer in the affective work of feeling mothering. It is a work that is both rife with emotion, but also demands from and of that emotion the responsibility embedded and embodied within maternal agency. In contrast, the work of feeling mothering in the photograph of Omar Rahman, I think, is incited through the maternal agency enacted by Kim Staten's advocacy for him, feeling mothering signifying both the mothering of his mother and becoming sensible to the viewer of the photograph through Staten's literal action. That the literal in these two instances is only accessible through the figurative also brings to the fore the work of reproduction, refigured itself from the biological to the digital. Park writes, Digital and other technologies queer cultural processes of, re of reproduction by queering the temporal and spatial structures of mothering, and that this in turn transforms the experience of maternal love. 
Love is where I'd like to end, here and otherwise. Park begins cybric mothering by asking, how exactly does communication technology transform love and how love is lived? I find myself asking in concert, less elegantly, how does love transform activism and how activism is lived? And I find one possible answer from social media in a response from one of my students and friends. And it may also be an answer to the paper not written, the one about the thulacine, not about fun. So, how does love transform activism and how activism is lived? By claiming a space to sift through this darkness, to find our truths, and follow the voice inside of us that is screaming in a whisper, fight. Thank you.